So it was December 2006, and I was telling one of my college classmates that I would soon be studying abroad on a program called Semester at Sea. And my, col my college classmate said to me, wow, I heard Desmond Tutu will be sailing with you this voyage. And I looked at him, and I, I nonchalantly said, oh, yeah, he's really cool. I'm, I'm very excited. Inside, I had no earthly idea who Desmond Tutu was. So I was pretty you know, embarrassed, of course. Apparently, I was going to be spending uh, 100 days on a ship with someone who was a pretty big deal. So you can imagine, I went home that night, and I was furiously Googling away, and I quickly became aware of how inspiring the Archbishop has been and continues to be. So, you know, a few months later, I'm on the MV Explorer, our ship, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and listening to, as we like to call him, Desi, host a fireside chat in our student union. He introduced us to the concept of Ubuntu from South Africa, explaining, we believe a person is a person because of other persons. I need you to be you so that I can be me. So if I've learned one thing through all of my travels over the years, it's that our commonalities far exceed our differences. We share the same hopes, goals, fears, dreams. We simply have different ways of reaching these. So three years ago, I was in Moscow, and after befriending a Thai Australian and a Dutch Kiwi, we toured the city together. And thanks to a connection of the Dutchman, we somehow ended up at this uh, small Russian house party. So there we were, in this communist block-style apartment building, listening to young Russian college students tell us about how they felt about politics, how America is portrayed in the Russian media, and how security issues affect their daily lives in Russia. My new Russian friend showed me that millennials in both countries share the same frustrations with the economy and their political systems, and that we should try to bridge this gap through more discussions to compare and contrast what we can do in our own communities. Likewise, in the years since then, in meeting so many Russian friends, I've learned that a country is not rooted in its government or politics, it's rooted in its individual people. So that night, our subconscious environment of Ubuntu was created by our mutual presence through dialogue and discussion. So five months later, in 2011, after the Great Northern Japan earthquake, I was living in Japan at the time, in the far south, and a friend of mine and I decided to travel up to the Tohoku region where the tsunami and earthquake hit. We had the triple disaster with the nuclear plant, we were going to volunteer with an organization called OGA for Aid. And what we would be doing is helping clear land to grow produce to sell at high-end Tokyo restaurants. And this would generate much needed revenue for the local elderly population whose businesses had been wiped out and they were able to work the land that they owned in the area. So, you know, we went to the train station, we boarded a train in the big city of Sendai, conveniently choosing to ignore the fact that our destination station wasn't listed on the board. We thought we could figure it out. So we had about three train layovers on the way, um, Japan being very high-tech, there are all these train apps, and we thought we'd use the first train layover to hop out and use the restroom very quickly, hop back on the train. So as I was standing in line in the restroom, um, my friend was there, I looked over at this older Japanese woman, and as this happens in, in rural Japan, she seemed very curious in this random Westerner in this small town uh, train station, and she felt very invited uh, to ask me what I was doing there. And I replied, we're going to Minami Sanriku, a town that was just wiped off the earth by the tsunami. And if you've seen the news since then, this was usually one of the two that you saw. And she said she was going there too, but shook her head. And so at this point, you get this feeling like, I don't think I want to hear what she's going to say. Um, but she explained that our destination train station, like several others, had been wiped away by the tsunami. How are we going to get there, she asked. 
Well, we concluded that we would just take the train as far as possible and then take a taxi the rest of the way. Now, Tomoko said that her relatives were coming to pick her up at the current station and that she would offer us a ride, but she wasn't sure there would be room in the car. So we thanked her for her kindness and then reboarded the train. So a few minutes later, to our shock, Tomoko comes running back onto the train, saying that there was room in the car. So prior to meeting our volunteer organizers, Tomoko and her brother-in-law drove us all around what was left of Minami Sanriku. And here you can see some of the temporary housing. They pointed out the remains of the post office, um, where their friends' houses used to stand, uh, the hill where teachers led their students to safety. Needless to, day, to say, it was pretty sobering hearing their stories. So afterwards, we thought everything was done. They insisted on taking us back to their family members' kasetsu because they were staying in places like these here. And there were rows and rows of them at the top of a hill in the event of future tsunamis in the aftermath. So once there, we sat inside the government-style housing that we'd repeatedly seen on the news in Japan. And they gave us traditional tea and snacks, and we listened to the stories of their other family members who were lost in the tsunami. There were shrines outside all of these small buildings um, to pay homage to their lost family members. So for a couple of foreigners living thousands of kilometers away in southern Japan, this family humanized the people of the Tohoku region and made the tragedy personal to us. And it all started with a simple conversation in the restroom. So like the people of Russia and Minami Sanriku, we all want to be seen and heard, valued as a contributing member of society. But fewer of us actually are. So with ubiquitous devices, we can connect with anyone we want, whenever we want. In her book, The Power of Off, Nancy Collier wrote that the, a majority of Americans now check their phones over 150 times per day, or every six minutes. Pretty terrifying, if you think about it. And young adults send an average of 100 and text, uh, 110 text messages every day. So we're closing the world off and bringing it at the same time. So in this 24-hour media and communications accessibility, we're distracted more than ever now, often prevented from connecting with those who are right in front of us. It's as if we risk alienating the in-person relationships for the sake of increasing the intimacy with the digital ones. This has resulted in more feelings of isolation, depression, and in some cases, the polarization of communities, as described in The New Yorker and The Atlantic. Underscoring these cases of increased depression and isolation, a recent study by the University of Michigan found that Facebook actually makes us less happy. Not necessarily surprising when you think about the FOMO, or fear of missing out phenomenon, and the feelings of inferiority and jealousy that can be triggered in reading about others' achievements at times. Herein lies the paradox of hyperconnectivity. The more we connect digitally, the farther apart we drift physically in terms of interconnected well-being. We have unprecedented power to speak across endless evolving digital platforms and, shape the, and to shape the conversation in unimaginable ways. But our voices are being drowned out by white noise, the media, technology, one another. So how do we fix this? In a society in which we can arbitrarily define our mediums of communication, two-way, multi-directional, consistent and meaningful conversation is imperative. We aren't going to agree on everything, but we're not going to disagree on it either. So when we put some effort in finding common ground and uniting around common interests, it's often inevitable. But again, how do we do it? So my travels brought a lot of conversations with people around the world, and I often found that we all have different communication styles. But two aspects of the conversation never change, talking and listening. On a most basic level, the first step is to have more conversations intentionally. 
consider who you want to connect with, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in a small group. What do you hope to achieve by talking with other people? Second, show up. Give others your full attention. We all know what it's felt like to be sitting at a table, sharing a story, only to look up and see our companion on their phone. Be others focused here. Put the phones away. Third, slip three small words into your conversations and overall language whenever possible. And, might, could. These words are more open-ended, inviting the possibility that multiple truths, not alternative facts, might indeed be true. They help avoid othering, revealing less assumption that what I'm saying is right. Your conversation partner might not realize this tactic, but as conversations go, they will be more likely to mimic your tone, allowing you both to steer the conversation in a more positive direction. Fourth, ask questions that other people want to hear. A lot of times when people ask you questions, it's because it's a, it's a topic that they themselves want to talk about. Better yet, ask half open-ended questions. So I think there are several fields of thought that are very pro-open-ended questions, but I like half open-ended questions better, and here's why. You employ a bit more specificity to make it easier for the other person to answer the question. So instead of saying, how's work going? Ask, what's been your favorite thing about work these days? It makes the conversation more interesting, too, to be honest. Number five. If you stumble upon common ground or a common interest, run with it. How can you take this common interest or shared value a step further? What might collaboration look like? Six, share success stories of engaging conversations. In my case, the, a recent one happened at a local microbrewery in Tacoma where I was talking with two soldiers from different military branches. Naturally, the recent election came up, but I was so excited because I learned so much. And so I started telling other people, and this encouraged them to have similar uh, conversations and not be afraid of what they might hear. So thus, sharing your success stories of what you learned will propel your own motivation to do it again, and then also encourage other people to experiment with similar tactics and strategies. Number seven. What happens if you don't find common ground? You know, 100% of the time, you know, it's just not possible. So you always have the option to meet up later with who you've been talking about after you've had a chance to do more research. You also should maybe mention that you would agree to think over the other person's idea. The conversation doesn't have to end at that moment. It might go in a different direction in the future. Lastly, why do we need more conversations? If Facebook is the new town hall, we must positively augment it. So taking things from the online world and meshing it with our conversations in the personal world here. In connecting with others in person, we are building actual relational intelligence. We are then able to reflect on and learn from the connections that we make through examining our own lives and telling our own stories. Finding common ground and uniting around a common interest is evidence of being heard. When we are heard, we are counted. We are considered. And we are more likely to build community with others who have heard us, and vice versa. With these feelings of community, people are more inclined towards taking positive action towards predetermined goals and taking on different things uh, in terms of activism as well. If we can create a culture that can engage in more dialogue in terms of understanding and empathy, that will show that we are finally able and willing to engage as a society, and pro progress comes from there. So my last thoughts for you today are basically, be brave enough to start a conversation that matters. Be edu-curious, curious about your own education. When we talk and listen, we humanize one another. We connect. And as Archbishop Tutu joyfully ex exclaimed, when we connect and humanize one another, we expand. And when we expand, we rise.
we rise together. I look forward to hearing about your conversations. Thank you.